like to bring this all around and back to Felisa for her to put her findings in a, in a broader context for us and remind us of exactly what they are and their importance. So let's remind us what we've learned here today. I'm interested in exceptions, and I think many of us are interested in those exceptions to the rules. Why are things constants in nature? That keeps me up at night. Why? I was probably a very difficult child in junior high and high school. But what I'll say is that that kind of openness to questions is part of what I want, I hope, that the work of myself and my team that produced this. What I want to really reiterate is it's not about arsenic, and this isn't about Mono Lake. It's about thinking about life in a planetary context and asking questions, simple questions, with a simple experimental design. And so in like a bigger scale, let's go from the small, and then we'll go into the abstract. All life on Earth required carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So I've shown here today that we've discovered a microbe that can substitute arsenic for phosphorus in its major biomolecules. Not just DNA, but things like ATP, that many of those high school students out there, I hope, recognize. And also all sorts of other biomolecules. What does that suggest? It cracks open the door to the potential. You know, my niece asks me, how did we get here? And are we alone in the universe? And it's profound that we don't know the answers exactly to that yet. Maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe in her lifetime, she'll be able to, to, be able to answer that. But I hope my work serves as a proof of concept that we can experimentally test and show evidence of what else is possible. So I'd like to roll some footage just to give us the expansive nature of life, from microbes to crustacea to bugs to mammals to everything you know that's alive on planet Earth. Again, hearkening back to the idea of the pale blue dot. Understanding life here, all sorts of life, lions and tigers and bears, and how everything we know is on this tree of life. Everything you've ever thought of so far that we can see on this tree of life. So what we're presenting here today is a member of this tree of life. We're cracking open that door. Strain GFAJ1, the bacterium, is a different way to do business. Just to open the possibility to what else is possible. It has solved the challenge of being alive in a very different way than, than we knew of. What other questions can we ask? This will inform us about life on our own planet, and it will help inform us of life. We will find it one day elsewhere in the universe. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stephen Benner, um, from the uh, founder and distinguished fellow from the Foundation of Applied Molecular Evolution. And he's spent a lot of his life uh, uh, as an organic chemist and, uh, and studying the chemistry of life. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm the curmudgeon here. I'm the chemist who has been brought in, as Felisa knows, to throw wet blankets on things and to try to damp a little bit the enthusiasm. Um, my next three minutes will be successful if I convey to you folks uh, why chemists think that this is an exceptional result and why, therefore, chemists will, like Carl Sagan says, uh, require exceptional evidence to support it. And um, uh, I also want to make sure you folks understand why we nonetheless find it interesting. Um, what Felisa has found, of course, is a microbe that grows in the environment which has a lot of arsenic and very little phosphorus. Um, um, the Astrobiology Institute, which we are parts of, uh, are, is the one place in American science where you can go to find geologists and microbiologists and astronomers and chemists together where we can have the um, productive clash that leads to big discoveries about big questions. What is life? What could alien life look like? And so my goal in the next 30 seconds or so is to try to give you as a layman the understanding of how uh, this is an exceptional result, how it might be um, looked at in greater detail. Because one thing that will survive is the Felice's microbe, and that will be an excellent system to explore questions about how arsenic is tolerated and phosphorus is limited in organisms that are placed under environmental stress. So I brought my, my Richard Feynman props with me, uh, which is a representation of a molecule, right? And these molecules are, say, representing a biopolymer. And of course, we're making them out of steel. And the result is that it's tough, right? And of course, as Felisa has mentioned, arsenate 
is made out of, in this particular case, aluminum foil. And of course, it's not as tough as steel, but when a bacteria is going to try to form a new chain, it's going to try to find in the environment the links that go to form the chain. And of course, if there's arsenate around, as a weak link, it will maybe confuse and maybe deceived by the structure of arsenate and the similarities to join two chains together, not by a steel chain, but rather by an arsenate chain. And of course, these are compounds that have been studied in model form. The specific arsenate DNA has actually never been isolated, but there are compounds that are similar to it. Different kinds of atoms, but still carbon, oxygen, arsenic, oxygen, carbon linkages. And so we know that they're relatively unstable. They fall apart with half-lives measured in the order of minutes conveniently. And so when you try to put them into a DNA molecule, right, and then you put it under stress, they fall apart. And then, of course, your biological system says, oh, my God, I've just destroyed my molecule. I've got to go back again. So again, if there's arsenate in the environment, right, you can get the story. You waste a lot of energy and a lot of time trying to put into um, DNA backbone arsenate, where if the arsenate ester falls apart, you're effectively saying that arsenate is the, I guess we call it the wolf, demon wolf, or demon sheep in sheep's clothing. It tr fools the enzymes into taking it instead of what it should take. There are two ways that biological systems in general can manage this. One way, of course, is to be to get very good at distinguishing between sheep and wolves in sheep's clothing. And therefore, uh, well, the, the end result is, of course, that you don't get fooled by the analog. The other possibility, and it's also conceivable, that the biological system can have evolved to manage the weak link. And they might manage the weak link by, for example, binding something to the weak link, sequestering it keeping it tight. But the difficulty that we're having, or in fact, almost anybody with chemistry who is familiar with this literature will say, is, well, wait a minute. This DNA molecule has allegedly been isolated away from the other molecules in the biological system. So we remember all this old chemistry, and we don't believe it. And that's what you're going to see a lot of people say. Now, keep in mind, old chemistry can be wrong. And in fact, one of the wonderful things about being in a science is, as Richard Feynman would say, science begins when you distrust experts. And of course, as the expert in chemistry, I'm saying that you should distrust me. But the bottom line out of all this is that what you're looking at here is a, an exceptional claim based on the context of the chemistry. And of course, um, when we can go into great details about what experiments you might do in the future to explore this. But what Felicia has produced is a very, very useful system to go ask these kind of questions. One last point. Remember, the weakness of the link is a weakness measured at room temperature, 35, 37 degrees centigrade, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit in water. If you go to an exotic environment, and the National Academy of Sciences looked, produced a book, which is actually you can go have, it's coming out of the National Research Council called The Limits of Life and Organic, of, of, or, Limits of Organic Life in Planetary Systems, you realize that in our solar system there are places, Titan, a moon of Saturn is one of them, where the temperature is much lower, where very reactive species like arsenate could very well be useful because although they're too unstable to exist in many environments on Earth, they're not too unstable to exist in an environment like Titan, which is at minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a cold environment. And in fact, you might very well want to have the increased reactivity of arsenate in that environment just to get the reactions that you want to make your biopolymer chains go a little bit faster. So again, my role as the curmudgeon is to say, this is an exceptional result. I hope I can convey to you a little bit, maybe not in technical language, but in graphic language, why the chemist views this as an exceptional result. And so you will understand why in the NASA astrobiology program over the years, as these various disciplines for chemists and who are the doubters or the deniers, the microbiologists, the geologists will interact in a way to bring forward the process that science is, which is, of course, the clash of contradictory cultures in an effort to come up with the truth to inspire, of course, Americans' youth to go through the effort of studying science to the, knowing full well that there are these kinds of very interesting questions out there like what is life and where might we find it if not on Earth? Thank you, Steve. I have a question for you. So would you as an organic chemist consider replacing your graduate students with microbes? Um, there are many of them these are, reactions. Many of my graduate students are undoubtedly watching. <laughs> and I, I love you all and I wouldn't think of replacing them. <laughs> <laughs>